Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Slavin, and we will begin the webinar shortly. I just see people joining, so maybe in two or three minutes we'll get started. Let's get started. Uh, I'm Mary Slavin. I'm co-leader of Learns Didactic Core, and I'm pleased to introduce today's presentation in our series, Using, Rehabilitation, Using Health Systems Research to Revolutionize Rehabilitation Care. So I just wanted to let people know that we do have uh, closed captioning options, and if you'd like to use the closed captioning for this webinar, there are two options. Uh, when it in, one is in the Zoom Navigator bar, you can select Show Captions if it is visible. If it's not visible, you can select More and then access the Closed Caption feature, select Captions, and then you can choose your preferred language. So again, I want to ensure that everyone has access to the uh, closed captioning. And uh, if, if you have any problems, please let me know. So today's webinar is in our uh, a webinar in our series, uh, follows a webinar presented by Dr. Gretchen Fiat, Breaking Down Learning Health System Silos, the Vital Role of Inclusive, Accessible, and Adaptive Teams, and a Grand Rounds presentation by Dr. Stephen Hunter, it Takes a Village, Team-Based Clinical Research Within Learning Health System. Both presentations are, are, are recorded and are archived on the LEARN website, along with other archived presentations. And you can view all LEARN archive presentations using the link provided in the chat. So with that, our speaker today is uh, Kristen Rosengren, the Vice President of Strategic Communications at Academy Health, where she plays a key role leading Academy Health's public relations, marketing, membership, and advocacy efforts. She guides the development of messaging and outreach to support Academy Health's mission, builds relationship with members and partners and other stakeholders, and increases the awareness and perceived value of health services research. Over the course of nearly 30 years in health communications and public relations, Ms. Rosengren has developed deep expertise in identifying the right audiences to drive change, understand the motivations and influences, establish trust, and provide information that is timely and relevant to their evolving needs. She regularly draws on her experiences to provide virtual and in-person communications and training for researchers, advocates, and scientists. Ms. Rosengren's talk will be followed by a Q&A session. We ask that you enter your questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom so that we can address them once the talk concludes. And after the presentation, we'll provide a link to evaluation survey. We'll also conduct a brief poll to learn more about participants. And we'll conclude the webinar by sharing information about upcoming learn events and opportunities. So now I think you can agree we can all have a lot to learn from Ms. Rosengren and I introduce her to present her talk, Strategic Communications for uh, Strategies for uh, Research Impact. And welcome Ms. Rosengren. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us on this Monday after a time change. I really am both pleased and, and flattered uh, to be here and to have this conversation with you. Uh, we're going to bring up our slides, um, and I will, as that is happening, I'll tell you just a little bit about Academy Health. So I will look to my colleagues to get that loaded for us. Um, we can go ahead to the vision and mission. So as they said, I am the VP for communications at Academy Health. And Academy Health is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that represents both the individuals and organizations that produce and use health services research to improve health and healthcare. Uh, I am part of the leadership team, so I do help with the overall strategic direction. Um, and as the bio said, my particular expertise is around guidance 
for programs and projects that leverage communications to advance the mission. And I think the mission is really important here because it reflects some synergies between the Learn Group uh, and, and Academy Health. We work to improve health and healthcare for all by advancing evidence to inform policy and practice. And clearly using information and evidence to impact the policy process is part of that mission. I did train in journalism and public relations. So this entire presentation is gonna be informed by that training and my experience. Now let's talk on the next slide about the difference before I get into the practical considerations of how we do this work. I wanna talk about sort of how evidence is actually used in policy and not just whether it is used. So almost three decades ago, Weiss articulated that knowledge can be used by policymakers in one of three ways, instrumental, conceptual, or symbolic. And you may be familiar with this approach and study, but just to reconfirm all of that, a conceptual use refers to when a change of uh, awareness or understanding of certain issues. So for example, the body of research on the challenges of quality, safety, and disparities in healthcare has actually changed the way policymakers understand and act on significant provisions in quality and disparities in various health reform proposals being considered in Washington, right? They have a different understanding of the issues than they might've had 10 to 15 years ago. Instrumental use of knowledge is when we're actually directly shaping policy and it results in an action. So, for example, findings from research about the detrimental impact of unstable insurance coverage for children and how it affects their access to and use of services or their quality of care over time actually led to significant provisions being included in the Child Health Insurance Program uh, Reauthorization Act and actually helped focus state activities not only on reaching out to and enrolling children, but keeping them enrolled and retaining them once that happens. That was an instrumental use. Symbolic use is actually referring to the ways that evidence might be used to legitimize existing policies or positions. And we see a lot of that in today's policy process, particularly when we think about the cadre of sponsored research that exists to promote or support various policy proposals. Uh, now, there are lots of strong feelings about symbolic use and sponsored research, but I don't want to impugn the entire field just because it's sponsored doesn't necessarily mean it's not high quality research um, and symbolic use uh, can have its purposes. But for the most part today, we're going to talk about instrumental and conceptual use. Now, let me give you some examples of what that might look like in Academy Health's world. On the next slide, I have four different types of research or four different award winning pieces of research. The first three all received Academy Health's HSR Impact Award, which actually recognizes a body of work that has made an impact on policy. So this is an award for the, for the work and not necessarily for the researcher. Um, I think there are a few in this virtual room who are going to be unfamiliar with the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment. But as a reminder, the impetus of this particular work was that Oregon decided to expand Medicaid coverage to low-income adults. And for budget reasons, they decided to do that via lottery system. That created an opportunity for the researchers to conduct a randomized trial and evaluate the impact of Medicaid coverage on health and financial outcomes. The findings, which were widely reported and discussed at the time, suggested that expanding Medicaid coverage could provide important benefits to low-income folks. It would also provide, um, excuse me, it would also add additional evidence about Medicaid expansion and the potential implications at the exact moment that states were considering expanding um, expansion under the Affordable Care Act. So uh, this was a tremendously important study, partially because of its timing and what it was able to tell us as we were thinking about policy solutions. The second example on this slide is called The Invisible Wounds of War, and it's researched by Terry Tenelian and her colleagues at RAND. They examine the prevalence and cost of post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and traumatic brain injury in returning veterans, as well as the programs to address them. Their dissemination of those findings helped educate policymakers, providers, veterans, and their families. And RAND's assessment actually altered the nation's policies for diagnosing and treating behavioral, behavioral, health, behavioral health conditions among returning service members. Of note, the RAND researchers offered four major policy proposals and action was taken on all four. The third example, again, you 
are likely familiar with a lot of this, is the Supreme Court's consideration of the King v. Burwell case. Uh, I think no one can underestimate the importance of the case at the time. It was a very politically charged environment, and opponents uh, were trying to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. They were looking for its full repeal, and this was one way to sort of start to undermine the pillars of that piece of legislation. A team of Urban Institute researchers developed a series of papers that outlined the implications of a finding for the plaintiffs, the ones that were against the ACA provisions. And the analytic work done by the team, which was led by Linda Blumberg, was cited in the government's brief to the court, as well as in 18 amicus briefs or or friends of the court brief, hundreds of media stories. And um, Dr. Blumberg testified on the findings before the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Ultimately, that Urban Institute work was prominently cited in Justice Roberts' majority opinion, which found for the government and kept the ACA in place. Certainly instrumental use in that case. And then the last piece is a state level example, which I think gets more to a more localized option. In this case, two physician health researchers were conducting an analysis of colorectal cancer screening for Medicaid beneficiaries. And they found that the level of testing was unjustifiably low. And so they recommended that a quality measure be developed in Medicaid for colorectal screening, again, to try and drive those screening rates up. The team used lessons learned from a communication seminar, very much like this one, and they advocated for the CRC screening measure uh, to to be added to the Medicaid adult core set in their home state of Washington. They developed a full communication strategy. They engaged with collaboration partners and built a coalition of organizations to help advocate for this work. And they also worked with advocacy groups who helped them facilitate a communication with with the Medicaid performance measure work group regarding that particular criteria and what was needed for measure approval. Ultimately, the Medicaid performance measures work group did vote unanimously to add that CRC screening measure Uh, in the state of Washington. So they were successful in getting, again, instrumental use, driving a policy change uh, based on the evidence that they had created. So let's move ahead and talk about what it takes to go from research impact like those four examples, um, from research to impact like those four examples did. Obviously high quality research is the foundation for that impact, right? It was good work at the right time, but The other thing that makes this work stand out is the deliberate and effective communication of the work to the right decision makers at the right time. Now, I call that strategic communications. And the appropriate translation of the work into practice could include the domains of implementation science or knowledge translation and even science communication. Our focus today is on strategic communications itself. And I define that as, as do others in the field, planned and purpose-driven communication designed to reach a particular audience, that's going to be a big theme of our talk today, and to drive a particular outcome. What do you want them to do with what you have shared? To do that, we have to have a firm grasp on what we want to accomplish. Who has the power to make that change happen? What is their existing position or mindset? What do they think now? And what do we want them to do or believe when we're done communicating with them? And then how are we going to communicate with them? Where are we going to engage? Um, What are we going to use to get their attention? These are the basic components of a strategic communications plan. And we're going to walk through them together today, step by step. So let's start with talking about our goal. On the next slide, I have a sort of a, a, a quick definition of what um, the policy process might look like or what we might think about trying to accomplish. So the most important part of our communication plan is defining that step. What is it we want to accomplish? And it will be the question that drives everything else. There are many kinds of policy and many opportunities for impact. So when I say policy, I tend to refer to it as little p policy because I don't want you to always think only of legislation and, and regulation. Policy can be legislative like that, but it could also be the ways that evidence informs internal policies and procedures, guidelines, standards, rules, all the things you see in the green stack of books there. 
Impact can also occur at the point of choosing between multiple options. I think this is a Webster's definition. I probably should have cited that. But what I like about it is the focus on choice and definition. A course of action selected from among alternatives in light of given conditions. Is there really any better alignment to what we're trying to do as researchers? We're giving people an understanding of what happens when you do A and what happens when you do B, right? So research evidence can help us inform decision makers about potential trade-offs of different choices. That is a policy outcome. Let's move forward to the next slide and talk about who we need to reach. So I said you need to understand what you want to do and you need to understand who has the power to make that happen, right? So there are lots of types of decision makers. Often again, with big P policy, we think about Congress and the administration and the states, but we also want to be thinking about things like community-based organizations, non-governmental -gov organizations, what about internal quality leads in your organization? These are all important decision makers who can have, a, have an impact on making policy change. It's not just happening on Capitol Hill. So take, for example, uh, recent reports probably back in the spring and early winter of this year that a number of employers were actually choosing to offer telemedicine coverage as part of their health benefits in 2023 as they did their annual um, campaign renewals. And they did that as a way to work around the issue of restrictions on abortion care, especially as we think about people working in a hybrid environment or a remote environment. They made a policy decision by employers and insurance or insurers that was based on conditions at the time in our national discourse. In a learning health system, impact, impact might look entirely differently. Maybe it's a modification of standard operating procedures or helping to inform the implementation and evaluation of new care guidelines by licensing or accrediting organizations. So I want you to continue when you think about communicating effectively, who are the people you need to reach? And I want you to think more broadly than just academic or just legislative audiences, but really who has the levers of power that can make the change that your research indicates is necessary? One of the ways that we do that is that we map out audiences. And on the next slide, I'm gonna to begin to show you what that looks like. And you'll see that it's not really all that fancy. Um, in fact, this often looks a lot more like a lively brainstorm. I might convene a few of my colleagues in a room with a whiteboard and we start thinking about what we want to accomplish and then literally drawing out the people with direct influence over that action as well as those who may be affected by it and need to know, thinking about uh, patients and consumers and caregivers, for example, um, or those who might need to be informed it's happening and have some stake in, in the conversation. Then we go further and we actually start to do little sublines for individuals and organizations who have influence over the primary audiences, the ones who can act. So this is a, this is a general concept of what that might look like if you were mapping audiences. And I want to move forward and show you a little bit more about what I mean when I say talking about influencers. So as we think about influencers, we do this to expand our thinking and to look for opportunities to connect with the ultimate decision makers. We also do this to expand our understanding of the landscape of influence and the potential issues that could either help or hinder the translation of a particular idea into action. We want to know not just who has that direct active power, but who has influential power. Who does the audience trust and how might we be able to build or bridge relationships with trusted brokers and intermediaries who have the necessary credibility to deliver that information? In the colorectal screening example I gave you earlier, I told you they worked with a coalition of advocates who ultimately helped introduce them to the right people to communicate about the measure. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about influencer audiences. The advocates they were working could, with couldn't change the measure, but they knew who could and they could open those doors. So for example, as we think about influencers, we might be thinking about in a policymaker environment, constituents, party leaders, their own personal staff, media. There are lots of people who influence a policymaker. 
At the provider level, you may be thinking about accrediting and licensing organizations, their professional societies, maybe their staff. Again, friends and family are often a surprisingly effective uh, influencer audience. And at the community organizer level or the community-based organization level, you might be thinking about their bosses. Who sits on their board of directors? Where does the money come from? Um, who are the community members with whom they're working or who might influence their policy? Who are their peers? And maybe they're listening to social media. These are all potential influencer audiences. Um, and so as you think about mapping out your audiences, you want to continue to think about, again, power and influence. And I'm going to give you a really detailed example of what that might look like from the policy space. So on the next slide, I start to draw out an example from a seminar that I did like this about five years ago with a team from the state of Arkansas. And this team had been doing a community engaged project on opioid use disorder. And they wanted the governor to pass legislation or issue an executive order based on those findings. So I began to work with them and ask them, well, who has influence over the governor? And on the next slide, you'll see that the first thing out of their mouth was, well, obviously the legislature, right? The legislature, it's a Republican governor, it's a Republican legislator, legislature, they all just do the same thing. The group I was working with was a little jaded. They all just do the same thing. And I said, okay. Who has influence over the legislature? And they started to list all of the typical things you would say, the party, the constituents, the media. And about that time, one of the research members went, oh, who are we kidding? The only people that they listen to is Walmart. And I was like, what? Walmart? So if you go to the next slide, you can see, I was like, okay, fine, we'll write it down. Walmart, we'll write it down. And it was said in jest, and I think, again, a little bit sort of from a place of being jaded. But it led to a watershed moment for the team in their strategy because it gave us the opportunity to ask the question, why would Walmart potentially care about opioid, opioid use disorder in Arkansas? Well, there are lots of reasons. Maybe they're concerned about their health insurance rates because they're providing insurance to their associates. Maybe they're concerned about missed work from people who have or are struggling with opioid use disorder or, or caring for a family member who does. Maybe they're concerned about crime and loss prevention in their stores. Maybe it's affecting turnover and employee performance. There are a ton of reasons why Walmart might actually feel really strongly about ways to reduce opioid use disorder in Arkansas. Maybe, just maybe, the advocacy and HR leaders at Walmart could be an influential audience to help these researchers convey their information to the legislature and the governor in a non-political way. So you can see that it opened up a whole different avenue for their work. Now I'll say, I don't know if they actually pursued that strategy, but I think it's really instructive about the power of taking the time to map out your audiences and ask yourself questions. Who cares about this issue? Who might care about this issue that can be an ally? And how might they influence the ultimate decision maker? So I want you to keep those in mind. Once you understand who your audiences are, it's an excellent time to move forward and start to do a little bit of research on what they need. So on the next slide, I have an example for you based on my colleague um, and coworkers work with a, with a community organizer named James. Now, once we start to think about this particular audience, in this case, a community organizer, we want to dig into their motivators and needs. This helps us think about the messages that we're going to work with these folks. It also helps us think about ways to establish our own credibility and trust with these potential audiences. So we want to start to look at things like how they have gathered their information. What do they care about? What is the culture and context from which they operate? Um, what are their needs? What are they trying to accomplish? What are their priorities? Um, and to what for what outcomes are they being held accountable? Again, we're looking for their influencer audiences, their information sources, what are they reading and watching, um, whether or not we can get a sense of their beliefs or their uh, strategies. All of these things help us understand these audiences. Um, doing this research up front helps you understand where they are coming from and how their issues and priorities might align with your own. It helps you understand what researchers, what 
words they're using, what words are effective for them. So again, if you think about something, um, again, at the big policy level globally, right? Are they using speeches where they talk a lot about gun control or are they talking a lot where they talk about um, safety and gun violence as a public health issue, right? You can get a sense of where they fall on an ideological spectrum, um, what kind of words and, and approaches might be effective for them. You can also get a sense about um, where they're getting their information and how you might reach them. These are all incredibly valuable as you start to pursue the next piece of our communication strategy, which is beginning to develop um, your messages. Now, before I move on to the messages, this is the perfect slide. I want to talk a little bit about how we understand and do this research on an audience member in a non-creepy stalker way, right? There are the there are lots of ways to do this. The most important and probably most effective way to do audience research is to include potential audiences, those who have the power to make change, on the project team or at the beginning of your work when you're developing your research questions. Again, as you are thinking about a research topic, it is helpful to frame that in, in the context of how will this information be used? What change might it lead to? And as you think about that, that's a good time to include one of your potential audience members in shaping and framing the question. Are you asking the question in a way that's relevant? That also allows you to get to know them and their concerns. You can also do direct research via things like social media channels, uh, the website formerly, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, I particularly lean on LinkedIn in this day and age. I don't find Twitter to be as effective as it used to be. Um, LinkedIn is excellent because it is a professional website. You can look up people that you know are your influencers. For example, your congressperson or the head of quality improvement in your system. But you can also look up types of people because there are organizations and associations that have a presence on LinkedIn. You can see who are members. What do those people look like? What do they have in common? You can look at hashtags in LinkedIn and in other social media platforms, things like cancer. Or you, know, you can look for those, thing, those types of hashtags and see what people are talking about with relationship to that issue. You can also get a sense of what people have done lately um, and what words that might work for them. You can look at speeches and uh, published articles. Um, if you have the resources, nothing beats doing some primary research, so focus groups um, or even motivational interviewing, talking to folks about what they care about. That can be incredibly helpful. Um, you can also just do a simple Google search um, looking uh, at the news tab, seeing if they have been quoted lately, looking for videos of speeches that they've given. Um, and then internally, it's really important to remember that you do have resources that can help you think about what's important internally. Certainly, you can always talk to people if you already have those relationships. But you might also look at things like board of directors minutes, employee newsletters, strategic and operational plans to get a sense of what someone's priorities are and the words that they're using. That is a lot of potential research, but it helps you create that profile like the one I had of James. Before I move on, I do wanna talk a little bit about the environment that we're living in and the ways that we talk about science publicly and the way we might deal with external audiences. So I don't have to tell anyone that we live in extraordinary times. I think the data are pretty clear and robust. But for the purposes of communication strategy, I do want to highlight some issues of trust or lack thereof in science and institutions because it does affect the way we communicate and with whom. This slide is adapted from the 2023 Edelman Trust Barometer special report, which shows that trust in peers, friends and family is surging and that trust in health experts and scientists has fallen by about two percentage points year over year. Data by the Pew Research Center from December 2021 was similarly stark. At that point, 22%, nearly a quarter of every American surveyed, said they had not too much or no confidence at all in scientists. And it's not just the general public. A recent survey by NORC and the, uh, the ABIM, um, the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, with whom Academy Health is engaged in developing a trust research agenda, found that physicians trust, so doctors and nurses trust, or sorry, physicians trust, 
not nurses, my apologies. They're trusting government health agencies fell during the pandemic with 43% reporting a de decreased trust in government health agencies. Now, I'm not saying all of this to depress to you, although <laughs> it's not terribly uplifting, uh, but the point is that as trust in institutions wanes, it is increasingly important that we communicate in ways that recognize the power of those peer networks and also helps reinforce our own credibility as individuals. So we can't just exhort people to trust the science and expect them to listen. More often than not, that's actually the wrong approach, the exact wrong approach. In the book Made to Stick, the authors who happen to be brothers, Chip and Dan Heath, note that credible messages are more likely to stick and that credibly, credibility can be garnered from many things. So certainly our credentials and training engender a certain amount of trust. But as institutional trust changes, then we can get different kinds of credibility from different kinds of things. For example, whether an idea that we are proposing conforms with someone's preconceived ideas. If that's true, they're more likely to, more likely to trust us. Whether or not um, you trust the individual speaker. So do you know this person or they, were they introduced to you by someone that you know and trust? That can increase credibility. Think about what makes you credible with your target audiences. What values and priorities do you already share? And can you work from a place where you already agree with things? Now, that's, again, going to be very important when you're dealing with external audiences. But even internally, when you think about internal politics or internal constraints, what are the things that you and the decision maker with whom you are trying to communicate your evidence and drive change, what are the things that you share as priorities? What are the things that you can potentially agree upon and how can you work from that space? And again, you will have done some research on your audiences so that you can start to identify those things. Once you have done all of this work, right, you're now ready finally to start thinking about your key messages. So on the next slide, I have four big buckets of tips for developing effective messages. Um, and these are, there's a lot here, so I'm gonna try and slow my speaking down. I know I'm a little bit fast, um, but I'm gonna also try to get through it because I know we have some limited time together. And I'll start with the obvious, uh, keep it simple. Now, simple in my world means using things like plain language, eliminating jargon and acronyms, and focusing on clear and concrete explanations. I'm not telling you to dumb things down. In fact, writing plainly requires very concerted effort and humility. It's often much harder to write plainly because it requires you to step back and think about your work through someone else's eyes. You're aiming for clarity when you're working for simplicity. And that also includes the presentation of your data. We know from science and research that large numbers, probabilities, and percentages are very difficult for most listeners and readers to get their head around. And it can actually detract from rather than advance your message because they hear a big number and they're like, yeah, it's a lot. But because it's so big, it doesn't actually ultimately resonate. It's just, it feels like too much. So as you think about presenting your data, consider literally visualizing it with a good graph or infographic or figuratively doing so by painting a picture with your words using concrete um, examples and analogies. One of my favorite visual examples is the rethink your drink image of Ziploc bags of sugar that demonstrate the amount of sweeteners in different drinks. You've probably seen this meme on social media. It's literally like a science fair poster with bags of sugar. They get bigger as the drinks get more sugary. Uh, it's just a great way to change a number, a the amount of grams, which doesn't really mean something to most people, into a visual that they can understand. That's the level of simplicity that you're looking for. Um, another tip for big numbers is to convert your percentages into easier imag to imagine numbers. So instead of saying 20% of the children in Virginia, say something like three out of five children in our kids' school, right? Because it's still 20%. But this is a very visceral reaction because now you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You can imagine those children, you know them. So it's a much more visceral image. It's a little bit easier to get your head around. 
Uh, the tip for meeting audiences where they are gets back to the idea of mindsets, interests, culture, and context. Remember, by the time you get to the stage, you've done some research on these audiences and you know generally where they fall on various systems of belief and understanding of your issue. The scientists at the Frameworks Institute have done a tremendous amount of research thinking about the cognitive frames that we use to apply and evaluate information as it comes into us. And they have a number of online free resources that you can look at, particularly, particularly if you're dealing with hot button issues. They help you think about ways to use language that will, will trigger a positive emotional response in people, or at least an open or neutral one, instead of one that has been politicized or, um, or fragmented and will have a negative reaction. So I really encourage you to check out the Frameworks Institute if you're working on highly sensitive issues. And then finally, you will want to remember that every group has norms of behavior and engagement. Whether it's Capitol Hill or your neighborhood book club, there are certain ways of communicating and carrying oneself that tends to signal belonging in those groups, right? You don't dress the same on Capitol Hill as you would at book club. You don't talk the same on Capitol Hill as you would at book club. Understanding those norms can re and communicating sort of in concordance with those can help you be much more credible, seen, be seen as credible because you're seen as an insider rather than an outsider. Um, and your audience research can help you with that, as can working with some trusted influencers or intermediaries. Um, now, I am not saying to communicate in ways that don't align with your sort of personal integrity, um, but thinking about some of those uh, simpler ways to signal belonging or, or um, being an insider is something that is helpful. Over the last few years, one of the more persistent criticisms of science has actually been that the science is always changing. Now, we know that's kind of the point, right? That's a feature, not a bug. We're supposed to be evolving in our understanding of issues, but the framing of science as fickle or uncertain is actually really bad for our credibility. It's frustrating to turn to an expert when you're worried about something like COVID and have them tell you that they don't know or they have caveats and they have qualifications because more science is needed. That leaves people thinking, we don't actually know what we're talking about. But there's recent research uh, from Demi Oba and Jonathan Berger that helps us understand how we can hedge our bets or hedge our recommendations in ways that do inspire confidence. Because we know as scientists and researchers, too much certainty can also feel really uncomfortable, right? So Berger and Oba tell us that the way to effectively hedge is to do so in a way that, that implies more certainty and a stronger personal opinion. So you might say something like, in my experience and having looked at the data, option A is more likely than option B to give us the patient outcomes we're looking for. That's gonna be a much more effective and confident statement than saying something like option A is associated with better outcomes, right? First of all, that second phrase is a little too jargony, but also it doesn't give you that concrete piece and it doesn't, it doesn't convey your experience and expertise in a way that inspires confidence. Dr. Kate Baker, who is currently the provost of the University of Chicago and was one of the authors of the Oregon study I mentioned earlier, also served on Academy Health's board of directors right about the time she rolled off of President Bush's uh, Council of Economic Advisors. And she came and she did a brown bag for all of us on staff. There was really a master class in hedging appropriately in highly political environments. And what she told us is that she learned very quickly going from an academic environment to the Council of Economic, Advi economic Advisors that policymakers don't want deeply nuanced qualified responses, right? They want an answer in 15 minutes, not 15 months. And so what she learned to say and what I have found to be incredibly helpful has changed the way I communicate for the rest of my career. She would have this very strategic response and she would say, here's what I know right now with confidence. Here's what I can reasonably, reasonably predict based on what we know so far. And here's what I, can, I cannot answer without additional research. So here's what I know. Here's what I can probably predict. And here's what I just cannot tell you without doing more work. It's a very simple, confident, and clear way of hedging 
uh, but also in, in giving people a sense of the expertise and the certainty. The last tip I'm gonna share on this slide is probably my favorite because it is imp informed by recency bias. Um, but it is from another Jonah Berger book and it's called Magic Words. And it looked at how certain word choices could positively impact the outcomes we seek. In the book, Berger advocates for using nouns instead of verbs when we're asking someone to do something. Now, nouns, verbs, it's kind of, you know, gets a little communications cognitively. You got to think that through. So I simplified it and said, let's call them names. And what I mean is that when we're asking someone to do something, we're asking them to make a change, it is helpful to, instead of asking them to act, which is a verb, ask them to be a thing, which is a noun. And let me give you an example of what that looks like in the real world so it'll make a little more sense. Researchers working with children found that when they asked the children to be a helper instead of clean the classroom, be a noun, clean a verb, compliance actually jumped significantly. And that's because in asking them to be a helper, they were giving children an identity and a sense of self that was positive and reinforcing instead of just asking them to do more stuff. And this can work for us in, a, in an environment where, where we're trying to drive change, right? Because we can ask someone to be a champion for children's health instead of simply, simply asking them to write a policy. Because the first gives them a desirable identity and gives that person being asked status. Now, you're going to have to tell them how to be a champion, right? But if you lead with, can you be a champion? Can you commit to moving this forward? It gives them that, that sense of being, it gives them a chance to sort of be the hero, right? Um, so I'm going to take a very short breath as I tell you, we've talked about knowing what we want to accomplish. We've talked about understanding who has the power to make that change understanding who they are and what motivates them through our audience research and starting to frame our messages. My next three slides are gonna to continue to build on how to frame our messages. And the first one is a pretty obvious, I think, uh, delivery tip. And it's something that you may have heard before, which is to flip your abstract. So when you've done your work, you have a project outcome, you have a um, abstract for a research paper, when you're communicating it with people with whom you want to work to make change, it's helpful to flip that abstract. So instead of using the rote way of communicating that you've trained in your, in your programs to say, okay, here's my hypothesis and here's the data I used and here's what we found and this is the implications, you flip it and you start with, this is the problem and here are the implications that we might, these are the ways that we might solve it. Here's how I know that. So then you get into your data and what you did. Um, so you start with the problem that makes sense or the or the outcome and then build in the data. Another way to look at that is to tell a story. And on the next slide, I give you a graphic of what a typical story, I, story arc might look like. So you understand your audience, you've toyed around with their language. Now you can start to tell them a story and stories are deeply powerful. Human beings are just wired to love a story. The Heath brothers in the book I mentioned earlier, Made to Stick, extol the virtue of stories. And you can't wade very far into most communications research or dissemination presentations like this one without someone tossing around the role of narrative. We need to change the narrative. We need to have a narrative. Um, there's good reason for that. Data and evidence are critical to the work that we're doing, but stories are what make us memorable. And crafting a good story actually follows a pretty simple pattern. With a little bit of practice, you can use this method to explain even really highly complex ideas, but it does take a little bit of work. So we're going to start simply. Stories need a beginning, a middle, and an end. On the graphic on this side, I've divided that into the part of the story that is sort of the status and the struggle. Here's what's happening now. Here's why that's wrong. That's the light blue. And the climax and the resolution. So we learned, and then we did, and this is what happened, right? And I gave you some words to choose from when you're starting to craft a story. Once, this is how things were. Then this happened. 
And so something different occurred. And you can start to write those stories out. So I'm going to give you a very simple version of that so you can hear what it looks like when you use this construct. So I want you to imagine for a minute that I am a researcher and you are the policymaker who has the opportunity to change a thing. Um, and in this case, I'm going to make a pitch or I'm going to make an ask of you that's focused on social determinants. So here's what this looks like when I tell my story. Once, we thought that health was just a factor of things like genetics and nutrition and disease. But even with massive improvements in the science and medicine and our approach to healthcare, there were entire populations of people who had worse health and worse health outcomes than everyone else. And it didn't make any sense. And then researchers and clinicians looked more closely at that problem and they saw a link between what we now call the social determinants of health, things like where we live and work and play and the food we eat and real measurable effects on our health. With those social determinants of health working against them, people couldn't live their best lives and have their best health outcomes, no matter how hard they tried. So now we know that if we want to give people the best chance to live better, healthier lives, we have to address the social determinants. And you, important decision maker person, you have more options to help solve this problem. Let me give you an example of what we could do and how you can be a leader in this effort. And in scene. So that's what the story looks like when we're trying to talk about social determinants, for example. But you could apply this to any type of issue about which you were trying to communicate. So other than the incredible simplicity of that argument, remember I was trained in journalism, not public health. Um, the other thing I want you to notice about that story is that the antagonist or the bad guy, the villain in this story is the social determinants. They are the problem. It is not the decision maker. It's not their political party, their budget, their organization, right? The problem is the social determinants. The decision maker is the hero of our little tale. And as you are thinking about these highly complex issues, perhaps, the, perhaps these highly politicized issues, it's really important to remember that everyone wants to be the hero. So invite your audience into that role. Again, call them names, right? Give them a noun, give them an identity so that they are more inclined to help you as you're crafting your messages. All right, so next option for crafting your message in your story is a tool that I developed called Message Mad Lips, which one, I should probably work on the trademark there because if you were a child of the 80s like me, you remember Mad Lips and this is gonna look really familiar to you. So the point of the Message Mad Lips is to give you a way to do sort of a fill in the blank elevator pitch. You've heard of an elevator pitch, I think, but you have, if you had an elevator ride to tell someone what you were doing, how would you explain it? So this is a fill in the blank tool that you can use and you'll have access to my slides. So I encourage you to do so. But in this case, you're starting again with the problem, right? I'm here today to talk to you about, let's say the problem of high admission rates, readmission rates. Then you frame that problem in a way that creates credibility by aligning to your audience's needs. So you say, it's important because it could indicate issues in quality of care and we're being evaluated by these numbers and penalized for missing the mark. So there are lots of reasons why readmission, high readmission rates might be a problem, but what you wanna focus on in your elevator pitch is why it matters to the person with whom you're speaking. Then you give them some options, my research or my project, it shows that if we change X, then Y is likely to happen, right? You're giving them options from a which to choose. That's the policy impact piece. And then you tell a quick short, short, short story, which is easy for me to say on a Monday. You tell them a short story. Let me give you an example. And you tell them a story. When we did this as part of the pilot or as part of the research program, we heard this from the clinical staff and we saw these outcomes, right? Uh, remember privacy and all of those things as you craft your story. And then you ask them to do what you need. That's why I think we should expand the pilot to more departments and reevaluate it at six months. Can you help me, you know, by being a champion to leadership to get this expanded, right? So you're giving them, again, a clear ask, tell them what you want them to do and give them giving them a clear identity. So that's how you could use these message Mad Libs just do a fill in the blank pitch. All right, I'm gonna shift gears on you again. So we did our goal, our audiences, we researched them, we talked about how to have an effective message. 
Now I want to uh, come back and sort of bring all of, start to bring all of this together a little bit. And right about now, you're probably thinking she has said nothing about my peer reviewed research. Um, what about the paper? We spent hundreds of hours on it. We did a revise and resubmit. It's going to be JAMA. It's great. Yes, absolutely. But don't like, don't stop there, right? You still need to get that work out there. There are a million good reasons, maybe not a million, there are a lot of good reasons for peer reviewed research, right? Not the least of which is the continued review and rigor that comes from the process itself. Again, importantly, good research is part of effective changing policy, right? We need the good research from which to work. So the peer review process is part of that. But let's be clear, vanishingly few research articles ever make their way into policy or practice without focused transla translation to other audiences. So you may have heard that it takes 17 years for research to move from policy to practice. That is 17 years too many, if it happens at all. Science and data do not, as the saying goes, speak for themselves. We have to speak for them. And we do that by making sure that that work gets out into the appropriate places where, there are, where the key audiences can see them. So the last piece of our planned and purpose-driven communications approach is developing materials for various audiences that can continue to push the information into the right places at the right time. Now, what you see on this slide is one research article, which is the piece on the left, and the way on the right that the Academy Health team developed multiple communications for the different audiences. In this case, you have an example of a research brief. A research brief should actually be brief. We're talking one to two pages. Uh, a health affairs article that we pitched to health affairs, an Academy Health blog that we wrote and posted on our own blog and then promoted via our social media challenges, and a series of promotional tweets behind that. Now, this was before Twitter took its most recent turn. If we were doing this again today, we might put more of that effort instead of into tweets into infographics for something like Instagram or threads, which is getting some additional traction. We might instead put it on LinkedIn, but you get the sense that that social media piece becomes important. We also would probably put it in our newsletters to all of our members, and we'd be continuing to push this out. As you consider what you need to communicate to whom and when, remember that you can repurpose and reframe information for different audiences by adjusting the format, The in communications we would say the medium or the outlet, the place you put it, the length and the presentation. Just remember that as you do that, you want your focus to remain very firmly on the places and outlets your audiences are using regularly. So it could be something like this. It could be an internal newsletter. It could be a partnership with a local arts organization. Like this is an opportunity for some creativity. Uh, maybe it's a bus stop billboard or a popular podcast. All of these are options for getting your message out. On the next two slides, I'm going to show you some typical tools that we would use. And we'll talk a very little bit about some of their pros and cons. So as you're thinking about what channels are right for your project, again, you want to revisit your goal. You want to think about your audiences. Um, communication channels can be in person, which is what you see on this slide, or printed and digital and informal. So in person, um, thinking about the pros and cons, there are a couple of different options here. There are meetings, there are public speaking opportunities, there are interviews. When you're using channels like this, there's a lot more to think about than just the words that you choose because you're in person. So you need to tailor your message's length, right? A speech is very different than an interview. You wanna be able to answer in like 30 seconds versus having three minutes or 45 minutes as I have today. Um, you wanna ta tailor the length. You wanna think about your story arc. Remember your, you know, once, then, and so now. Um, and emphasize the bottom line so people remember it. You may have heard the term bottom line up front. Um, again, that's that inverting of the abstract, so thinking about that. That's going to be particularly important in meetings where you want to lead with your key points um, so that you can build on them throughout the meeting, depending on how long you have with someone. You might want to prepare for a meeting for, by planning for interruptions and questions. Um, you might want to plan for objections uh, so that you're ready for that and maybe practice some of those things. If you've done your audience research or you have a member of your key audience on your team, you can practice some of those things with them to see how it's going to resonate and how it's going to fall. 
When it comes to public speaking, uh, you do want to limit yourself to a few key messages. Um, you might, you know, you might have heard three. Three is a nice benchmark, but sometimes you have more, like today when I have five. Um, but you want to come back to them and reiterate them so that they stick with folks as you go forward. Um, and then for interviews, I want you to think of any type of interview, whether it's with the media um, or others, as a conversation with a purpose. You are not there just to answer questions, right? The interviewer has a thing that they want from you, which is information. And you have something you want from them, which is dissemination of a message. So you prepare ahead for what you're going to say to increase the likelihood that you actually say it in a way that is easily consumable. And again, you want to keep those very brief, you know, 10 to 10 to 30 seconds uh, so that it doesn't get edited out. When you are communicating in print and digital, which I have on the next slide, you can see that you need to think about different things. You begin to think about things like word counts. Um, you want to think about the images that you have to work from. Maybe there is photography or graphics that you can share because we know that in print and digital media, imagery attracts the eye and gets more, gets more reaction, gets more engagement. Um, and I want to remind you that while it is tempting to think of things that are print and digital as one-way communications, in most cases in our current environment, you really should be thinking about them as a conversation. That is certainly true of social media. You don't just put something out there and then walk away. You need to be engaging with it. Um, whether that is in traditional social media, Facebook or Instagram or some of those, um, or in even really blogs and LinkedIn, you want to continue to engage with that content that helps keep it at the top. The algorithm will recognize that engagement. It helps keep it prominent. But again, also it allows you to engage with the audience and build that relationship and that trust over time. Letters to the editor or op-eds. Uh, which appear opposite the editorial page. That's why that, that's how they're named. Serve a similar function. You're responding to something that is happening in the media or in the news, and you're continuing a conversation that the reporter started when they originally wrote the piece. So you want to be sure that with letters and op-eds, you are responding to a thing um, and continuing the conversation, moving it forward. Letters to Congress, testimony, and letters to committee at the policy level, at the federal policy level, at the state policy level, sort of a very different function. So make sure that in those cases, you're working with someone, uh, perhaps with your, from your internal public affairs team, who can help you understand what you're trying to achieve um, and whether those are effective channels for you, because it's a little bit harder to do. Publications will vary depending on the audience and the format, but all have very specific guidance about how long it can be, whether or not you can include graphics and images, how your citation should appear, so no matter what, uh, it's important to check those guidelines and to remember that you need a very tight opening sentence. In communications, we call that a lead, a very tight opening sentence that will draw people in. And again, the way to do that is to start with the problem and the implications rather than the hypothesis. OK, so I am about ready to wrap this up so that we can move to our questions. But I want to spend just this last slide talking about the importance of strategic communications as a long game. So with your goals and your audiences and your messages and your materials, you've got all of the parts of your plan. It's time to start to execute on that strategy and ultimately evaluate its impact. And so this is where, as you've gotten all of those materials, those core materials together, you start to think about the timing of your outreach, right? The time that you, that you, communicate with folks should align with their time to act, right? So it's not going to help you to ask to extend a pilot um, if there's no budget for that, right? So you should be talking about extending a pilot project at the time that the organization's developing its budget for next year, right? So understanding the timing as a potential benchmark toward your ultimate goal becomes really important. Again, you will have done your audience research, so hopefully you'll know that, but that's true at the federal level as well, right? The time to ask for a grant is not like at the end of the budget year. That's not going to be a good thing for you, right? So you need to be thinking about those types of timelines and milestones when you think about your communications. Similarly, if you're in the middle of a research project, it's not the time to talk about findings, but it is the time to be building those relationships with your influencers. So align the timeline of your communication strategy and your research timeline in ways that make sense. 
And remember that communicating for impact is a long game. Um, it takes a long time to change people's minds um, and to build up that awareness, especially when you're thinking about um, instrumental use versus other types of use. So keep your destination in mind, uh, what it is you're trying to achieve and who, not just what, but who it will take to get there. Build those relationships and build coalitions and collaborations that can help extend your reach. Um, another thing is to remember to use your stories um, to explain, strategies to explain are often much more effective than ones to persuade um, and meet your audiences where they are now so you can help move them toward a better understanding. My final piece of advice is to stay curious. Um, as you evaluate your progress and you test your messages, you might tweak that over time as you build relationships. And that's all part of the process. As researchers, as people who are committed to quality improvement, um, you are thinking about the ways that things improve and change over time. And just like science itself, your communication plan should be sort of a living, changing thing. Um, use it, learn from it, adjust, and keep going. Um, so I have given you a lot to think about today, and I know you probably have some questions. I can see that in the Q&A pod. Uh, so I'm going to stop and take a breath. Um, my final slide is just some resources. I wanted to be, you to have those citations. Uh, and I think we can um, start to wrap up and move to the Q&A. Um, well, again, Kristen, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. You provided so many valuable resources and frameworks and all of those are going to help advance learning health systems research. Um, for our attendees, could you just take a moment to click on the evaluation link in the chat and let us know what other work or content you'd like us to feature as part of our, our grand rounds or webinars. And then we also have a poll question that we would like you to respond to. If you could just take a minute um, the poll set up and ready to go. So we have two questions. Have you ever developed any communications that were targeted for policymakers? First question. And second question, how would you rate your skills in developing policy communications? I see people are able to respond to those uh, polls now. That will help us get an idea of where our audience is and uh, how this might help you advance your work. 